Well, guys, I almost forgot how to preach. I took a little break and uh, I was like, ooh, ooh, God, I had such great rhythm going in, a rhythm. And I was like, oh, thank God it's not on me. It's not the Holy Spirit. And so uh, it just felt weird. And I'm glad I, I took a little break, you know, and Johnny's going to preach next Sunday. And then uh, we'll finish up on this, this story. And I already got a new series for us, okay? And so God is just good with the word, amen? He, he keeps giving us what we need, not what we want. I know some of it is, is hard to swallow, but let me tell you something. Truth. What's that song to say, Lord? Speak what is true. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. I pray that that's everybody's heart. That no matter how it's cut up, how it's sliced or diced, how it feels, truth is true. And let me tell you something. Truth was designed to hurt. Don't you wish truth wouldn't hurt? You know why truth hurts? Because truth breaks through deception. And you know what deception is? Deception was the lie that we believed in for all these years. So when truth comes, we say, no! I want, I want my deception. I want, I, I want it. I don't want the truth. I don't want to know this. I don't want to change. But if you're going to live for God, God is going to cause you to change. You can't hang around the anointed and not be transformed. Ain't been a person in this world that ever could hang around the anointing and not be transformed. Amen? So we're going to finish up our origin, the work, and the destiny of the devil. And you know what? This one's going to hurt. Because if I'm going to tell you how the devil's going to be destroyed, then I'm going to tell you how you're going to be destroyed. You see, it goes hand in hand. We have a destiny too. And our destiny is a choice. We can either serve God or we can serve the devil. But either way, you will choose. You will have to make a decision on whom ye this day will you serve. And when you hear about the terrible faith of the devil today, out of all the things he did, all the power he thought he had, all the lies and the deception and the people that he deceived. When you hear what's going to happen to him, you need to make sure that that doesn't happen to him. Praise God there's an end to this torment. Praise God there's an end to this torture. Praise God there's an end to this deception and this lie. Praise God there's an end to this struggle and this, and this unrestness and this wickedness. Praise God there's an end that is coming soon. We're like Abel that cries out from the grave and says, Lord, how long before you avenge my brother? We were talking about the origin, the work, and the destiny. And I gave you the definitions of the origin. The origin, the word origin means a, a point or a place where something begins or arises. And we talked about the origin of the devil, how he was created in heaven and how he was a cherub and how he sat on the throne room of heaven and he was made special. God gave him favor that he would be liked. God made him souls different than any other angel that that kind of went to his head and he created insolent pride. It's almost like one of you guys in here is good at doing something. You may be good in sports, you may be good in, in marksmanship, you may be good in, in, create, in creating things, you may be good in writing, you may be good in preaching. But those are all talents that God has given you for his kingdom. And some of us would take that and, and, and think more highly of ourselves or think that it's for a different purpose. But all gifts and talents are used for the kingdom of God, amen? And so when God made the devil, he made him his origin, and he made him with a specific purpose. And Satan allowed deception, self-deception, to come in and make himself think that he was better than God, stronger than God, wiser than God, smarter than God, and more powerful than God. And thus, he began his fall. And then, once he fell, 
Satan had a work to do, and his work is, was to destroy as many of God's creation as he could. Not only did he take a third of heaven with him, but he was to destroy every man and woman that ever God created. From generation to generation, there's been a curse over your family, and you have not known why. From generation to generation, he seeks to destroy every bloodline that comes from your loins and your father's father's loins. That any loin that wanted to serve God, he wanted to annihilate it and destroy it all the way back to the Old Testament. And that was his work. The Bible describes him as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Because this is what he does. He comes and he lies, he murders, and he devours. Therefore, he destroys. And so his work, the definition of work is an activity or, uh, of mental or physical effort to achieve a purpose or a result. And so as we broke down his order and work, now we're going to finish up with his destiny. And the destiny is this, and we all have a destiny. A destiny, the definition of destiny is the event that will happen to a person or a thing in the future. You see, my destiny is not done here yet. My destiny has already been solved by the kingdom of heaven. Even demons know your destiny in God. But I don't know my destiny. I don't know what it's going to get involved to. I don't know how many lives are going to be touched. All I know is I thank God that my destiny is in Him. No more am I lost wondering what my destiny is. No longer am I uncertain and, 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 and taking in drugs and women and, and the things that, that have nothing to do but bring destruction to myself. Now my destiny and my purpose has aligned together. And when your destiny and your purpose comes together, then you have your call. And where your call is and where your purpose is and where your destiny is, God will give you that passion. Do you won't be saying, Oh, I got it, go to the best for God. Yeah, come on, baby. Come on, kids. Let's go serve the Lord. God says the shock is easy, this burden life. He's no heavy taskmaster. He doesn't weigh you down. He lifts you up. He elevates you to his level. And then, you finally see that's why the song says, I once was blind, but now I see. You know what that is? That's you seeing your destiny. People perish without a vision. The Bible says people perish without hope, without a vision, without a purpose. That's why we started this church. It's called The Place of Purpose. We want you to come and find your purpose. We don't want you to be hopeless without a vision and destitute and destined and walking around not knowing nothing. That's not what God created you. He predestined you. That means he foreknew you. Doesn't matter what you went through and what you had to go through to get to where you're at now. All that matters is learning where you're at now and when you're ready to start your destiny. And so, we come up with the end of the works. And I wanted to bring out two points before, because when I do the devil's destiny, it's real quick. But I wanted to end it up with uh, the last part of the verse. Turn to your Bibles to 1 John 4. I'm going to start at verse 2. Now we're talking about the end of the works of the devil. We discussed what his works are. But in his works, knowing that he's out to destroy your life, as a believer, as a believer, as a believer, what is a believer? A believer is one that has set Christ as the Son of God and has asked Christ to come into their life and has asked Christ to forgive them of their sins. That is a believer. You see, even though the devil's out to destroy you, as a believer of true faith, we have no reason to fear the devil in his works. We know that he's out to get us. And he's out to get us once we turn our face towards God and we say, I'm going to trust in you, God. I'm going to believe in you, God. And I'm going to accept you, Jesus. And I'm going to place my faith in you. The devil doesn't want you to have faith in God. He wants you to have faith in everything but God. 
Because if he can get you to not have faith in God, then he can keep you away from God. You're not going to serve something that you don't believe in. You're not going to do something that you don't believe in. Right? And so, as the devil is out seeking who he may devour, causing havoc on your life, as a believer, you don't have to fear the devil. It doesn't matter if he attacks your marriage, if he attacks you, wherever you're at, your loved ones, your kids, we have a power and we have a right. And this is true for two reasons. And the first one is in John 4, and I want to read this to you. Because everybody goes to John 4, uh, 1 John 4, and they go to 4. But I'm going to start 1 John 4 and 2. And it says, by this you know the Spirit of God. You don't have to fear the devil's work because you know the Spirit of God. As a believer, one that has accepted Christ and has been filled with his Spirit, you are this person. And it says, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. You see, there's many religions out there that don't believe that Jesus Christ has come from the flesh. But the Bible tells us as a believer, as your faith, you believe every spirit that says that Jesus Christ has come from God. That's your confirmation. That's your understanding that even in the midst of everything that you see is true. And so the, the Bible goes on to say, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God, is the spirit of the Antichrist. The word anti means to oppose or against. And Christ is one definition, God in flesh. And so what the Antichrist wants to do, he wants to oppose and resist and be against God in the flesh, which is Jesus. That's why this, this word says, let you know by the Spirit that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in flesh and is from God. And then we go on to four. And four is our mainstay. For is the reason why, one of the reasons why we don't have to fear the devil. He says, but you, you believers, you children, are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. You see, one of the things that the Antichrist is going to do is he's going to come and he's going to confuse us through the systems of this world. The systems of the world is what we're moving into right now. Computers, cell phones, easy access to cyber activities, uh, the changing of the money system, what's going on right now in the UK. All these are the systems of the world. All these are where the Antichrist loves to hibernate. All these things are designed by the devil to come to an end so that when the Antichrist appears, he will appear and he's now in the world today. You see, the devil's been preparing for the Antichrist to come all this time. Just like God had to go and prepare Jesus to come from Abraham. You see, in spirituality and wickedness, there's always a preparation of what's coming. And only those that are led by the Spirit of God can discern from the Spirit of God what is going on. That's why God made prophets. Because he had no way to communicate with his people. And that's why they're called seers. Because they see what is happening in the spirit. And they tell you in the flesh, thus saith the Lord, don't walk down that road. And it's up to you to hear the word of God. And so all this time that the devil has been preparing, God says, but you little children, you shall know because you know God. And he says, now listen, it doesn't matter what you see before your eyes. It doesn't matter what the circumstance and the trial that faces you. It doesn't matter what you're up against. He said, listen, greater is he 
Who's he? Yahushua, Jesus Christ, God in flesh. That is in you, in him, that is in the world. When everybody's in line to receive the mark so they can buy and sell goods, so they can get their groceries, so they can cash their paycheck. If the chip has already been infused in Switzerland and other European countries, and they're working in their work office, they can use the computer and the fax machine, and they just swipe their hand. You see, when everybody's in line to fall for that and say, this is what you need to keep your job. This is what you need to get a paycheck. What are you going to do? It's the size of a grain of rice. It's harmless. It's able to live inside your body, your children's body, your dog's body, for all eternity in two places. Motorola and MasterCard did the survey and the test to test that chip out. Years ago, when we had no idea they were doing this behind our backs. And the two places that they found that it fits favorably is in the head and in the head. Isn't that ironic that that's what the Bible says? But you, little children, you shall know, for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? And the other reason how we'll know that we're able to stand against the enemy, we now live under the protection. Once you become a believer, once you accept Christ as your Savior, you are given the protection of the Holy Spirit. And it says that we now live in protection of the Holy Spirit. Nothing can happen. You, listen, you got to believe this. You got to believe this with all your faith. You got to believe this promise of God that nothing can happen to you unless God allows it. Nothing. Nothing. When you're in the will of God, nothing can happen to you. And that's God's announced. When you are a believer and you are walking with God and you're trying every day to get it right, nothing can happen to you unless God announced. You gotta understand that because you know what? Every test and trial that you go through, you gotta understand that God will allow it for a reason only. What did it say? It says he uses adversity to bring us closer to him. He has the power to stop adversity, but he chooses it to allow it to come so it can draw you closer to him. And you got to know this, that he says he won't allow you to suffer more than you can bear, that your test or your trial will not overtake you. So those of us that are going through them, that is going to continue to go through them, that will always go through them, that will never get away from going through them. I, that's my promise. I, it doesn't matter how much I can't stand this situation. I know that I can stand because God says it's a promise. And He will not, and we're going to read about this. Turn to your Bibles to Romans 8 and 28. And the reason why I say it, Romans 8 28, because everybody only reads 28. But I want to read the full promise and nothing but the promise, and so help me but the promise. We also know that whatever he permits, no matter how bad it may seem, then, Mama, whatever he permits, no matter how bad it may seem, he will and he can. A death in the family, a loss of a daughter or a son, a, a fire of appointment, a depression time in your life, a trauma so hard that you just can't stop with the night times, a broken marriage, the greatest betrayal that you've ever experienced in your life by a loved one, no matter what it is, no matter what it is, it does not even matter. It says that he can turn it out for our good. His promise in Romans 8 and 28, it says this, it says, and we know 
As a believer, you need to know this. As a believer, you need to understand this. As a believer, it needs to be the foundation of everything you do. The Bible tells us that all those that will live godly will suffer persecution, will suffer frustration, will suffer agony, will go through depressing times, will suffer. Whatever your suffering is, you just take whatever you're going through and put it under the word suffering. Because guess what? It's a promise. Because guess why? Because the enemy is going to make sure for serving God that he's going to make you suffer. And as we go further into this sermon, not today, but this teaching, we're going to bring up our robot, Job. And if you think your situation is bad, we're going to talk about Job. And it says this, and we know that. See, it's not something that you think you know. It's not like, well, maybe so. It is as sure and as true as I'm standing here in front of you. It is sure and as true as you sit in that chair and the breath is coming out your nostrils. It is sure and as true as you wake up in the morning and you go to use the bathroom and you want a bowl of cereal. It is sure and as true as you walk in the flesh right now today that you know, not that you think, not that you hope, not that you wish, but that you know. And the biggest way the devil gets us is he takes our knowing and he distorts it. And next thing you know, we begin to doubt, well, did God really say that? He wants to take your faith and expunge it from you. And he does that through life. Some of us are able to bounce back because we keep the word of God in our hearts. It don't matter if we get sucker punched and the wind gets knocked out of us. We get back up. That's why they make songs. We fall down, but we get up. Those are all encouraging theme songs for us to continue to fight the fight. But if you don't know, then you won't fight. And so when you read this, you have to read the word for literally what it's saying. It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to to his purpose. I've got news for you all. You're all called according to his purpose. Every last one. It ain't just for well, God saves the preachers. No, he saves the teachers too. And he saves the little kids too. And he saves the soldiers. And he saves the housewife. And he saves the mother and the father. And the divorced mom and the divorced dad and the single parent. He saves everybody. They all have a purpose. God's promise is that everybody, you may think that you're insignificant now because you don't know your destiny yet. But as you set your faith to God and you say, God, I believe, I believe, I believe, speak to me when it's true, then your destiny will begin to get revealed to you, line upon line. My dad used to always tell me, Mike, if God had to show you everything he had for you all at one time, I just say, Dad, I want more, God. I want, I want more. I want more. I want more. Why? Why can't He do this for me? Why can't I feel this? Why? 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 And He used to just come with His soothing words, and He would say this. And I say this to all you anxious people: If God had to show you everything, your destiny, everything that you're going to do for God. Could not happen. And I couldn't handle it. And then said that God was going to make me a great better guy in the end times. I, I went back to my mom and I said, Why? Why me? I don't know. He said, Because of your heart. And so I lived on that all my life. See, once you get that knowing you, nothing. Lord, like Paul says, I am persuaded. And neither depths nor height, nor demons or angels, things that come or things that was, can separate me from the love of Christ. 
because he knows. So in your trials, and your temptations, and your tribulations, and your frustrations, and your depression, and your weakness, and your discouragement, you gotta know that God is gonna work out all things. You know why? Because he gives you this promise. Let's go to verse 29. He says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn amongst many brothers. Ooh, listen to this. Listen to this. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to his image. Listen, salvation you can't move from. God says, I have predestined you to conform to the image of my son. Only willfully do you choose to not become conformed to the image of Christ. You have to willfully choose that decision. And so if you're sitting here in church today and that's not what you're trying to be, then you're only deceiving yourself and the devil has already got you in deception. He must be conformed to the image of Christ. And then he, he goes on to say this, and he says in verse 30, he says, and these whom he predestined, oh, thank you, Father. He also called, and these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, God don't give you the call, he's going to justify your call. And for God, I'm a murderer. God, I'm a, I, I, I came out of homosexuality. God, I, I used to be in the penitentiary. Whom he predestined, whom he called, he has already justified you. So you don't need no man or no church to justify the call of God. You have paid the price. Amen. Yes, Lord. You get that in your spirit. You let that stir you to want to serve God in a greater way. It don't matter if you came from pig slop. It don't matter if you was molested all your life. It don't matter if you've been turned out, turned in, a drug addict, a murderer, or a killer. If God has predestined you, Paul, the most murderous man in the Bible, if God has predestined you, Peter, one that died in Christ three times. Do you hear what I'm saying, church? The devil wants to destroy you. But I'm here to tell you that the word of God wants to restore you. Amen. And so we go on. Because there's more to this great promise. See why you must read farther than 28? Because once you read past 28, you get the whole promise. And it gives you hope. You was crying yesterday, but today you're going to rejoice. And it says here, he says, he going to justify you. He going to call you. He going to certify you. And he going to glorify you. That means he going to anoint you. Oh, hallelujah. Is, was that Mike Davis? The crackhead? What did he become? Such a strong person of God. I thought that boy was being in the penitentiary of day. That's Johnny. That's my son Johnny. He was taking it in his own. What you mean he's a pastor? Oh, Ooh, it looked like you're doing good too. And then the very person that has condemned you, their life is full of misery. Guess what? Guess what? God's going to use your destiny to get them. <laughs> and then he goes on and he says here, he says in 31. And here's the conclusion of the devil's work, and then I'm going to tell you how he's going to die. He says, what then shall we say to these things? Oh, I love this. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. You know, Jesus was a bad mother such a man. And he got it from God. Wait a minute, Jesus was God. Yeah, in the flesh, okay. So, uh, Jesus, God the Son, was a bad mother such a man. After he went and declared that I control all things, and I work out all things for the good of those that love the Lord, and who I predestined, who I foreknew, I called you, and I will justify you, clean you up, glorify you, and put you on your destiny. And then he says, so what you gonna say? He says, then what shall we say? He says, what then shall we say to these things? Hmm. Hmm, devil, what then shall we say to these things, Prince of Darkness? 
Hmm. Whom your murdering spirit that got me caught up in a case, what shall we say to them things? Hmm. Spirit of pornography, spirit of mescalation, spirit of, of adultery, oh, fornicating, hmm. Homosexuality, yes, then. Hmm. What shall we say to these things? You thought you had me. You thought you controlled me. You thought you won. But my God says, I've been predestined. And he says, I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to fix you up. And I'm going to glorify you. And I'm going to open doors where no man can open. And guess what? You're going to walk. And when you walk in there, Mike, I want you to walk like this. Hmm, what shall I say? <laughs> I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. And I'm going to say it in my coolest voice. Like Kelly Eastwood. I guess you're wondering how many minutes do I have? Do I have one? Or do I have five? You know how you still come on make my day. It says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And you just, you know, you just go on with your, your pimp off, and you just pimp on out of here. You know what I'm saying? You just go out of that mud. You, you know, you was a few minutes ago, you was help me, Jesus. He was like, Peter, the Christ saved me. The Christ stretched out his mother. And pulled him up. You see, God had already predestined Peter. And yeah, he said, Peter ain't drowning in that water right now. And Peter was chasing Jesus, but he stopped. He saw a naked woman. Oh, Jesus said, No, 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 so keep your eyes on me. Peter was running to Jesus and he said, Pfft, saw that And he lost his mind. Jesus said, no, 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 son, keep your eyes with me. You see, Peter was running to Jesus on the water and he, Pfft, and he, he got tempted. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Keep your eyes on me. You see? Now, Peter didn't know all those things, but Peter, I know you heard me. Now, let's go to Revelation. That was the last part of works. I had to finish that. But I'm so glad I did because it was like fire. But I want you to get Let's go to Revelation 20. How many know the devil has an end? How many know anything about the devil's end? Raise your hand. Good, good. Okay? Well, maybe I can teach you something a little more than you do. Amen? You see, when we talk about the devil's destiny, we have to talk about our destiny. Your destiny is plain and simple. It's either in God or it's not. That's, that's it. If you think for one moment in your little peanut head that you can sin and sit in the house of God and say that I'm okay, you have been deceived. And I will open up this passage with that statement. And let me say it again for deaf ears. Deaf ears, I command you to open up. And I command you to hear what the word of God says, not the system of this world says. The system of the world tells us we can do anything we want to and we ain't got to answer to nobody. We can live and screw and do and boo and who and be whatever we want to be. We can be murderers. We can be molesters. We can be fornicators. We can be uh, habitual liars. We can be deceivers. We can be destroyers. We can be cruel and wicked. And we ain't got an answer to nobody. Well, I say to you, deaf ears, if you think that you can get away with that, you have been deceived. Don't let the world condemn you. Don't let the sisters of the world, the influence of the Antichrist, one that opposes and that is against God in the flesh, deceive you. Remember, this whole thing is the greatest weapon the devil ever produced was the weapon of deception. We're still in this series. 
This is just another form. Revelation 20. When we start with Satan being battled. See, what I like about God is not only does he destroy the devil, but he also takes his time to do it. First, before he just outright kills him, he's going to torture him a little bit. Do you think that the devil wasn't torturing God through all these years? Do you think? This is what I came away with yesterday. I'm just going to put this out there. Do you think that God, knowing all, knew that the devil was going to do this and allowed him to do it for a purpose? You have to say yes. Because of Romans 8 28. You see, we always wanted to know, God, why didn't you just kill the devil? Why you have to let him touch us? <laughs> it messes our salvation. <laughs> you know, why? You can ask God that, but I wouldn't ask him nothing. Because he'll be telling you, uh, who are you to ask me? What did I tell you the power of God was? All the ability all the authority, all the strength to do as he pleases. Does the clay say to the potter, why you make me like this with a funny nose? <laughs> why I got a big butt? Why I'm so skinny? You're all beautiful in God's eyes. Right. Everything he makes is beautiful. That's why there's no such thing. It's I was made this way. When you're homosexual and lesbians come out and say, I was made this way, I was born this way. Really? There's no way you could possibly be born that way. Because if God made you a man, you was a man. And if God made you a woman, you was a woman. Because then you mock the creator. Yeah. Then God says, everything that I make is good. That's right. So why would he make something that is an abomination to him? That's right. Then it's a lie. And we let the systems of this world, the antichrist of fluence, remember, anti, opposing, or against Christ, God in flesh. You let the antichrist who created the systems of this world conform you and condition you to believe the whole lie that you was born this way. And there's no scientific fact that you were born that way. The only fact is a Y chromosome and an X chromosome. That's it. Everything in there between that is what a scientist or a doctor or a psychologist told you. Go ahead. You know what I hear about psychiatrists? How are they going to tell you if you got PSDB and you got bipolar and you got all this stuff? I'll be like, well, so what you got? <laughs> I'm sure all that study created some kind of anguish inside of you. <laughs> I, I, I imagine you must be frustrated in life sometimes, just like all of us. I wish a psych would try to psych me. I'll psych him out with the word of God. I tell people every time I see someone, stop letting another man label you. Did God tell you that? Then shut up. Okay? Because I just read you his promise. I just read you his promise and now you got it on your belt. That's one of your little weapons. You pull out Romans 8, 28 and you keep reading. You just don't stop. You keep reading. Because then you get the promise. And then you come out like this. What up, fool? I've been predestined. <laughs> you can't hold that sin over me. I'm justified. Glorified. Sanctified. Satisfied. <laughs> you better go ask my mom. <laughs> so we get into Satan being found. And this is really cool. Because for all those that hate the devil like me, I want you to know that that sucker got a hand coming. Yes, he does. And God will shame him in the worst way. And he says this. Chapter 20, verse 1. And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Do you mean the, the abyss is already made? Uh -huh. oh, yeah. It has a door on it, too. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it had the key. And he said this, and he said, holding the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. Yeah. Now just, just let me take your mind to this cartoon. My angel that I see is 50 feet tall. And it's chained 
is this thick. One leaf, that's how thick it is. It is the biggest, most powerful metal that you never even heard of. Titanium, seven, magnesium, also sulfate chain. <laughs> they ain't even made this kind of metal. It binds supernatural, spirit forms, human forms, flesh form. It binds everything up. You ain't breaking out of this Alcatraz. And here it comes. I bet you he just dragged it on the ground so you can hear death coming. Like Jason. I'm scared of I gotta make the sound. Just kill me, son. Quit making a sound. Jaws coming. I ain't going to walk for a long time. Shh. And he's just dragging. Shh. Oh, look. All the little sidekick demons were like, oh, look at him. Just hearing that coming. Oh, oh, oh. They lose him for something. They, they, they're coming for you. See, God didn't say he's going to bind the demons up. You kill the chief, you kill the tribe. You cut off the head of the saint. You kill the snake. So God only got to bound them. And every demon is going to run and hide in the little crevices for a thousand years, hoping that Michael don't come get them. <laughs> Here comes the man with the chain. You can be on one of them too. 
listen to who witnesses. Can't go be more than 144. Oh, you got that okay. right. Yeah. Okay, just wanna just wanna get that straight, okay? Mm -hmm. Listen to this. He says, and then I saw thrones, and they that sat on them in judgment. You see, you're gonna sit on the throne of judgment in the millennium. Yeah. But how do you get there? How do you become one of those? Well, I can tell you, there's only one way to get in that chair. You gotta pay the price for it. You gotta fulfill your destiny. You gotta be the one that got predestined before you were known and justified and sanctified and glorified. You know what? You gotta be one that was willing to follow Jesus and not the world. You gotta be the one that fell down and got back up and shook the dust off your feet and kept serving God. And it says this, he says, and, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those that, that had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead or their hands. And they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. says the rest of the dead the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed this is the first resurrection you see I'm going to be the first resurrection I'm not going to be the one that didn't come to life but you know the ones that's going to be the ones that didn't come to life is those that rejected Christ those that Set the church and said it was okay to live a sinful life against God's will and smiled every Sunday. Those that robbed the people of God every Sunday in the name of Jesus. Those that formed miracles in the church and fed missionaries and, and did all these God sponsored things but never knew God. See, those are the ones that's not going to rise in the first resurrection. To be a part of the first resurrection, you will be one that has laid down your life for Christ. That doesn't mean you didn't have to go before the king and announce yourself. That could have mean that you lived the life of Christ and you died in Christ. You don't have to be a martyr to be in the first resurrection. You have to be one that died in Christ. That means when Mama Davis passed, and she don't get to see none of this evilness that tribulation that comes from, she'll be in the first resurrection because of what she did in her life. Do you understand? Let's keep reading. This is what you see. This is just the word of God, not the word of God. And then it said this: "Blessed and holy is the one." Who, who has a part in the first resurrection. Ooh, blessed and holy is the person of the persons who have part in the first resurrection over these second death has no power. Oh Lord, we died one time and we died at one time into Christ. If you have to die a second time, then the scales will come one time. And the second death is eternal damnation. How do you want to die one time? And I want to make that one time to die in Christ for my Savior. I want to die in Jesus, fight and war and preaching and teaching and exposing darkness, and I'm going to die an honorable death. It don't matter if a bunch of demons run my car into a block wall or have a semi truck come and take me out. It don't matter if someone come in this church and fool me with an AK-47, I'm going to die in Christ. 
It don't matter if I go against the prince of darkness and I do a deliverance against a demonic person and I'm attacked and starved and killed. I'm going to die in Christ. It don't matter if Donald Trump comes and locks me up for preaching the gospel and executing me. I'm going to die in Christ. It don't matter if the false prophet and the antichrist tell me to bow down and worship him. I'm going to tell him to kiss me and I'm going to die in Christ. It don't matter. What an honor. And when you know as a soldier it's an honor to die serving your chief and commander. There's no greater reward. Let's keep reading my, my little chicklets. And he says that the second death has no power on those that are, are resurrected in the first death. But they will be priests of God and Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, here we go. Chapter 7, verse 7. And when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. Oh, here he come again. Now check out what they're going to try to do. He says Satan will be released from his prison. And he will come out. Here's that word again. He, look, the devil only got one trick. Deception. He just has many forms. Guess what he's going to get out of? His very first day, he to get out of jail. What you going to do when you get out of jail? I'm going to have some fun. <laughs> the very first thing he's going to do is go back to his most powerful weapon. Y'all been with Jesus for a thousand years, huh? Yeah, but you still lusted after that woman and that man, huh? You're still murdering behind Jesus' background. And he's going to come out. And he's going to go to all the four corners of the earth. And guess what? We had peace on earth for a thousand years. There was only one church. There wasn't a bunny, the whole minutes, the moment. was one church in this millennium. One church only. There ain't no other religion to be found. The 200,000 pagan religions is done. The backwards knowing of Joseph and, and whoever else, and uh, Muhammad and, and all, and Buddha, they go. There is just one church. One building, one city, one place, and you come from miles around to be transformed and have peace and be delivered for a thousand years. And it says when he has completed his prison sentence, he will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Mogog. To gather them for war. Now we're talking about the battle of Armageddon. The war. The number of them. Now listen. This is a dang old shame. Jesus set up his kingdom for a thousand years. Me, Johnny, Mom, Ryan, and hope all of y'all, Danny, we was in there being priests and ministry. Saving people, delivering people. And uh, people that will still have demons inside of them. And there was a peace. And there was only one religion in one world. And we all we did night and day was minister to people. The devil's out for a short time. And he uses his number one weapon, deception. And he goes around the world like a whirlwind. And he gathers up. Because guess what? We about to destroy this city of God that's been set up on my kingdom. Imagine how he plotted for a thousand years of everything he's going to do. And so he comes out. And I imagine for him to deceive after there's been peace for a thousand years, he has morphed into a stronger weapon of deception. Something so demonic and horrific that we can't even imagine in our fleshly thinking. Whatever he was able to do, he came out and he did it in the midst of God. And people followed him. That's how strong deception is. That's how powerful deception is. You can say you love Jesus and follow the devil in a minute. Because you lie to yourself. You're not honest about who you are. You play in the church. So you play with God. God says I'd rather have you hot or cold. Because if you lose warm, out of my mind. He got more respect for you to be a sinner and denounce God than you to make the phone and think that your life is justified with your sin that you live in. 
We're not talking about you slipped and fell and got back up. We're talking about you slipped and fell and stayed slipping and fell and keep slipping in. It ain't no one time sin. It's one perpetual. I like it. I love it. And can't nobody tell me nothing. I don't care how the pastor preach. I'm going to keep doing me and you just keep doing you, fool. Well, go. And the overwhelming amount was this. I think he went and grabbed them. He says they were like the sands of the seashore. Oh my God. Where did he find all these people? And he says, and they came up from the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever. And then we go to the last part. Verse 14. And we're talking about now that God has dealt with the devil. And now he's going to deal with us. And he says that he saw, verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, and those whose presence the earth and heaven filled, fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged for the things that were written in the books according to to their deeds. God said he's going to judge you for the deeds done from your heart. The things you meant to do. The things that you didn't repent for. And he says, even those in the sea, the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell. You see, we think that the everlasting lake of fire was hell. It's not. It's the abyss. Hell is a resting place. If you go into the Hebrew Bible and you study the book of Enoch, Enoch describes that when you die, that's why everybody says, my dad is not in heaven. Your dad and mom is not in heaven. There's two places that the dead go. God don't want y'all all in heaven with him. Be like, what are you doing up here? <laughs> so when you study in the Hebrew, there's two places and the angels, Ariel and Raphael, are charged. And here's how it works. Those that died in Christ are with the angel area. And they're in a place called paradise, which we all think is heaven. But it's not. Because when you read the book of Enoch, you remember Abel, the first son of Adam and Eve that was slain? It says in the book of Enoch that he cries out to heaven and says, God, when will you redeem the blood that was shed by my brother Cain? That tells you that Abel is not in heaven. So your mama, 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 daddy, daddy, he ain't in heaven. I hate to tell you, they ain't in heaven. But those that died in Christ is in a place similar to heaven. It's peace, it's tranquility, it's nice, it's trees. When the little boy said, I died and went to heaven, that's a lie. He don't know what he's talking about. He died and went to that place of paradise. No one is going to heaven of this earth. Sorry. We don't get that choice. Heaven is made for God and God alone. So, guess what? The other place is those that died in wickedness. And they're guarded by the other angel. And they're forbidden to leave. That's hell. That's why now we read this Bible, and for the first time, you see that God's going to throw the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of everlasting fire. He's going to throw the devil and his demons into the lake of everlasting fire. And then he's going to throw death and hell into the everlasting lake of fire. And then he's going to throw those that were not found in the book into the everlasting fire. And that is the truth. Do you need that kind of <laughs> Don't get me wrong. You want to get to that paradise place. Because those are the ones that are going to rise in the first resurrection and set up in the kingdom. And you know what? I used to always say my dad was in heaven. But until I read the book of Enoch, which was after he died, I called my mom. Guess what? Why did anyone want us to know about the three books of Enoch? 
Enoch was a man that, that got visions from God. The angels would come and take us to the realms of the heavenly, and he was exposed to all this stuff. That's why God took him. That's what the Bible says Enoch was, 326 years old, and then Enoch was no more. He had too much knowledge, and so God took him. Because God didn't want it. He talked about the watchers and the angels and the first angels and the first faith age. There's so much, guys, that you just will just blow. Just worry about salvation right now, okay? That's all you got to worry about. Listen. And it says here, And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And this is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Stop it. We have concluded the origin, the work, and the destiny of the Lord. The origin, the work, and the destiny. It seems like when we go through all this, in actuality, the devil has no power over us at all. It seems like we give him too much credit. He's only alive. That's all he is. He's a liar, he's a deceiver, he's a murderer, he's a thief. And you now know everything about him, where he's from, what was his origin, what is his work, and what's his destiny. The question is, you don't want to follow his destiny. Listen, none of us can escape our destiny. Your destiny is either in God or your destiny is out of God. My beloved, don't deceive yourself thinking that there's some gray areas there. That's not. It's either yeah or nay. You either make it in or you don't. There's no second chances you get once this has already happened. Once you're being judged, you don't get a second chance. You don't say, oh God, wait a minute. But my wife, she told me about Jesus and I just didn't want to. No. Now we'll open up the book of life. He will discuss your deeds. The only way that you don't get that judgment is if you're in the first resurrection. Because he already knows. You've been working side by side with him for a thousand years. It's important that everybody, if you walk out of this room again, then you must have died. Did you die in Christ? Did you get that last sin you did Saturday night at 12.55 a.m. under the blood? You know that girl you took off from the park? You remember that? You see, they used to say in black church, <laughs> you'd be in the club. First of all, ain't no rapture, so you ain't gonna get this escape nothing, okay? We ain't gonna we ain't gonna wake up and all the Mexicans gone. Okay? <laughs> we ain't gonna wake up and all the white people gone, well, they still gonna be here. Look. There ain't none of that happened, okay? Look, look, the rapture is two hundred years old, the word of God is five thousand years old. Don't you think that we would have learned about the rapture a long time ago? That's right. So it doesn't mention anything in the book of Revelations about the rapture. Doesn't mention anything in the Old Testament about the rapture. Matter of fact, there's two verses in all of the Bible. And some guy named Darwin, a Pentecost preacher from Ireland, came up with this to get more money for the church. And guess what? And us stupid American Pentecost took it and then next thing you know, we preaching the rapture. Why would the rapture, why would you give away a free pass? You didn't do more works than Paul, Peter, Stephen, John, Jesus, they didn't get a pass. So you did all of a sudden, you sometimes Sunday Christian is going to get a rapture pass? <laughs> now, 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 just thinking about it, you should be shaming yourself for believing this stupid crap. Right. That means you never read your Bible. Because why would God rapture your filthy, raggedy butt that ain't did nothing, don't even pay your tithes, and a man that preached the whole gospel of Europe and wrote the whole New Testament didn't get raptured? was amputated, decapitated, and torn into bits and pieces, in prison all his life. Where was his rapture? Think about it for a minute, people. Doesn't make any sense that you nullify the whole Bible for two scriptures that you don't understand about. 
there will be two and one will be cut up. If you study the Hebrew, it means one will be cut up in the truth, not raptured. Golly, you got to stop reading it that way and go study what does this mean? Who wrote this? What's the origin of this scripture? No, oh, it don't mean that. That's why I hate that theory, and I'm going to tell you right now. You ready for this? You can include whatever you got to say. <laughs> They'll tell you about where it came from, what's his name, the church he started from, and how old it really is. And you got people like my ex wife and they still rapture. They lost everything. We don't know Jesus. Well, go get a towel. No, we don't know Jesus. I'll pay your bills. No, we don't we know Jesus. Well, well, live off the, your, your people. Oh, yeah, we don't live off of people. We don't make known Jesus. I don't know what Jesus they serve. But that's how I like to get out of this stuff. Listen, there's only two places. You either die in God or you die out of God. Don't be, don't, don't deceive us. Father, we just thank you for the word today. We thank you, Father, that you said to come boldly to the throne of God. That we don't have to be shy. We don't have to procrastinate. But Father, we know that our destiny is in you, Father. We may not know what that looks like or how we're supposed to get there or what we're going to go through, but Father, we know that we have a destiny in you. So Father, I pray right now that this word, and as we finish this service, if there's anybody, Holy Spirit, we will tarry, we will wait for you. If there's anybody that want to get prayer, you may say, Pastor, I, I, I want to fulfill my destiny. I don't, I don't want to be lost. I don't want to be walking in the, in the, the, the shadows. I want to be right with God. I don't know how to get there. I don't know what to do, but I know that I just want to be there. Help me. Pray with me. And Father, I ask that you would just come and meet them in their need. Meet them in their need, Father. Give them some kind of sign or feeling to know that you heard their prayer. Father, I pray that only sincere people come to give prayer. If this is not what you want, don't waste God's time. But if it's what you want, then come. So, Father, we bless you. We thank you. And we bless the service. In Jesus' name, amen.